So uh, this is lecture three of uh, Josephus, Historian, Hero, and Traitor, an eight-week lecture series by Rabbi Lawrence Troster, um, and today is December 24th, 2014. So uh, last time we started looking at this issue of the defining of the word eudaios in Greek, and what I told you was is every time you see it, in your translation where it says Jew, replace it in your mind at least um, as Judean. And that the term Judean has um, three possible um, uh, meanings. One, a function of ethnic group and or geography, such as a person who came from Judea right, the actual geographical place, or a person who is called a Judean, because either they live in Judea and are a Judean, or they live somewhere else and their ancestors came from Judea. Meaning they might live in Cyprus, but they call themselves a Judean because they're descendants of people who came to Cyprus like from a, Judea. An ethnic group, yeah. yeah, an ethnic group. And, and sometimes they're formally recognized as a um, an ethnic enclave, like in Alexandria, called um, an ethnos, and they're headed by somebody called an ethnarch, the local community head. Okay. But would they be Jewish? Would you call no, them I, I, Judean and not be... Wait. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the third category, I'm going to skip to the third because it's much rarer, is the idea that it can denote citizenship that you could be someone who has a legal standing to live in Judea and not be ethnically Judean or religiously Judean, and that's not used as much. But it's not an unusual thing, and we talked about the example of the citizen becoming a Roman citizen. You know, you could be... Spanish or a Gaul and become a Roman. The Roman army was made up of numerous different people from all over the empire, and they were called the Roman army. Although, you know, sometimes the legions were given the names of the places that they were first organized or became famous in. Um, the, the most interesting for our purposes is the notion of Judean as a function of religion and will extend that to culture. Meaning, most Judeans who live in Judea are what we would call Jews. <laughs> they worship the God of Israel and they follow the practices of what it means to be a Judean. But what we see over this period of time of the Second Temple period, especially in the latter half, is the growth of the idea of Judean as as a religious identity, and that allows for conversion. So you have people who convert to become a Judean by religion. They may be ethnically something else, like the Idumeans. There are Idumeans who are not ethnically Judean, but become Judean by religion. Um, it would be interesting to know whether the Galilean Jews were originally something else, um, but certainly we know of actual conversions, and we'll look at a famous example, the royal family of Adiabene, which is a, uh, well, we'll talk about them. So those are the three categories, and what we're going to do um, from the material that you got, uh, which you should have, which I then, I also emailed to you from lecture two, is some uh, uh, references to these three different and it's on the first page is the one with the map, is some references to these three functions. So um, let's, we're going to start with the ethnic one, which is the original. Um, and what um, um, my teacher in this period, um, Shai Cohen's uh, belief was, um, in a very fine book on the whole notion of Jewish identity, 
in uh, this period of time and in the Talmudic period is that the emphasis shifted from the ethnic identification to the religious identification. The ethnic identification never completely leaves, but um, it does shift to a, the, the religious identity becomes more paramount. And so when we look at the writings of Josephus, we have to remember when he's writing this stuff, he's writing this in the latter part of the period. We're not looking at the earlier texts from the Tanakh itself, from Maccabees and other things, we're looking at um, his own material um, at a time when the religious identity is increasing as a definition of Judean, uh, but he's also talking about earlier periods of time. And so what you're going to see in Josephus is all three of these things. He doesn't always use it consistently. I mean, you know, you can't expect 100% consistency also because, um, you know, he's not always writing for the same um, audience. And, of course, he wrote the Antiquities some uh, 10, at least 10 to 15 years after he wrote uh, the Jewish Wars. So there may be some differences there. Also, remember, he's using material from uh, earlier sources um, which we're not really 100% sure exactly when he quotes them or not, necessarily. So that's why you're not going to always find it consistent in him. So let's begin with looking at um, the Antiquities of the Jews, chapter, uh, book 11, section 5, or chapter 5, sorry, book 11, chapter 5, um, and uh, I didn't put it in the number, but it's, it's, the line is 173. And in the edition that most of you are using, it's on page 356. So um, uh, it's, in fact, um, section 7. So it's book 11, chapter 5, uh, uh, paragraph uh, 7, line 173, which is found on page 350. Six. Chapter five, and then what else? Uh, section um, seven, <clears throat> line one seventy three. Do you have yeah, that, Sam? I do. Okay, so Sam, do you want to read it? So the Jews. <clears throat> so the Jews prepared for the work. That is the name they are called by from the day that they came up from Babylon, which is taken from the tribe of Judah which came first to these places, and thence both they and the country gained that appellation. Now, again, here we should change Jew to Judean. And notice, he says, so the Judeans prepared for the work. And he's talking about ancient history. He's talking about the return of the Babylonian exiles. Uh, okay? That, and the rebuilding of the temple. He's, he's going back to the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, primarily as his sources, and he's explaining the, the return of the exiles from Babylon and the rebuilding of the temple. And notice what he says, right? They're known as Judeans because that's what they were called when they came back from, from Babylon, which is taken from the tribe of Judah. All Judeans are descended from the tribe of Judah. And that's why they and the country are called that. So this is definitely the ethnic and geographic use of the term. Okay, so now let's go to the Jewish Wars, book two. Um, chapter three, line 42 which is found on page 720 in the edition we have. Um, line 42, uh, chapter 3, chapter three uh, paragraph 1. Um, Sam, do you have that now? What number? What sentence number? Uh, uh, paragraph 1. It's right after the beginning oh, of chapter 3. Line 20? Uh, line 42. Chapter 3. It's book 2, chapter 3, line 42. Now when that feast. <clears throat> Go ahead. Um, line 42. Did you yep. Say? It's right yeah. after the beginning of chapter 3. Oh, right after the beginning of chapter 3, you said. Yeah. Second pair. Basically second pair, right? No. 43, you say? 42. 42. Ah, uh, you're in the wrong book. Chapter 
Uh, is, is that the wars? The war two, the antiquities of the no, the wars. The wars. Uh, Irma, why don't you read it? Okay, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> now, now, when that feast, which was observed after seven weeks, and which the Jews called Pentecost, i.e. the 50th day, was at hand, its name <clears> being taken from the number of days after the Passover, the people got together, but not on account of the accustomed divine worship, but of the indignation they had at the present state of affairs. This takes place um, during the time of um, uh, during the time of Herod, I believe, um, and it is uh, Shavuot. Okay, when that's one of the pilgrimage festivals, when people come to Jerusalem. Okay, so read on. Wherefore, and notice. Um, again, the, which the Judeans it would be, go on, whereupon. Wherefore, wherefore an immense multitude ran together out of Galilee and Idumea and Jericho and Perea that was beyond Jordan. But the people that naturally belonged to Judea itself were above the rest, both in number and in the alacrity of the men. Notice the distinctions, okay? The other people he's talking about are all what we would call Jews. Mm -hmm. But they're being identified by the geographic location they come from. They are Idumeans. They are Galileans. They are Pereans. The people that naturally belong to the Judean Judeans, you might say. Okay? What page you 720. <clears throat> so there you see how the geographic and the ethnic distinctions are being made. And, and by the way, I mean, one of the things is that um, let's just, th these are all primarily um, Aramaic-speaking Aramaic people, but their accents would be different. And one of the things that the Judean Judeans did was make fun of the accent of the Galilean Judeans. Okay, um, let's take a look a little further on. Again, book two, but this time chapter six. Um, la uh, chapter six. Uh, line 93, which is on page 724, and it's in um, the beginning of paragraph 3. Sam, do you have that now? I do. So Caesar? So Caesar, yes. So Caesar, after he had heard both sides, dissolved the assembly for that time. But a few days afterwards, he gave the one half of Herod's kingdom to Arch Archelaus. Archelaus by the name of Ethnarch and promised to make him king also afterwards, if he rendered himself worthy of that dignity. But as to the other half, he divided it into two tetrarchies and gave them to two other sons of Herod, the one of them to Philip and the other to that Antipas who contested the kingdom with Ar Archelaus. So this is during the time of, of Augustus, and what happens is, is this is after the death of Herod, okay? And Herod had control over large parts of that area, not just Judea, but Samaria, the Galilee, and a whole bunch of other areas. So when Herod dies, Augustus decides to divide his kingdom into three parts. So Judea proper, he gives to Archelaus, but doesn't allow him to use the term king, which Herod did. He says, you're going to be ethnarch. All right? And, um, and the, so uh, Philip gets another part and Antipas gets another part. By the way, all of these guys' names was Herod Antipas, Herod Philip, Herod Archelaus. It gets very confusing. But anyway, uh, go on. Under this last was Perea and Galilee with a revenue of 200 talents. But Batania and Tra Traconitis and Aranitus and certain parts of Zeno's house about Jam Jamnia, with a revenue of a hundred talents, were made subject to Philip. So this is discussing all the various geographical divisions, and now we learn what Archelaus got. <clears throat> is a talent a certain amount of... Yeah, a, big, a, 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 a lot of money. <clears throat> that, I think that was the largest... Um, Billion. What? Billion. No, I don't know how you would call it today, but the talent, I think, was the largest... It was weight of silver. Mm -hmm. If you have a shekel, you know, then sort of, or a, whatever the others used, the, the, less, the, the highest level was a talent. Go on. While Idumea and all Judea 
and Samaria were parts of the ethnarchy of Archelaus, although Samaria was, raised, was eased of one quarter of its taxes out of regard to their not having revolted with the rest of the nation. He also made subject to him the following cities. All right, we'll stop there. But you'll notice there, there's this geographical division that Judea in this particular case is very much designed, is very much a geographical locale. All right? Relevance of ethno as opposed to king? Uh, it's a, it's power, it, power. It's also dignity and and and. Ethnarch suggests more direct Roman control. King is more like a vassal king, an ally rather than a direct rule. And then when he takes away Archelaus's um, territory and turn appoints a procurator, then it's direct Roman rule and no. Jewish independence except for local religious affairs. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole hierarchy of control that the Romans used throughout their empire. So this is first century. This is like four or uh, whatever the date of, uh, whenever Herod died, I think it's four CE, or is it six? It's either four or six. You got four on the Four, okay, so it's four CE, okay. Um, yeah, six is when Archelaus loses it. Um, okay, so now turn to chapter 18 in book two. And we're looking at um, line 510, which is uh, 755 paragraph 11. So... Um, Erman, do you want to pick it up there? So this is book two of the wars, chapter 18, uh, section, uh, paragraph 11, line 510. But, but Cestius sent Gallus, the commander of the 12th legion, into Galilee and delivered to him as many of his forces as he supposed sufficient to subdue that nation. He was received... Stop there. Notice, nation. Okay. The Galileans are deemed to be an ethnic group. That's what that word means here. So uh, Galilee, of course, was, we would call it, a large center of Jewish settlement at this time. Large Jewish populations, but they're called Galileans. All right. Um, we're not going to look at all of these, but let's look at the was next... That, was that and after the fact thing, or was that a divide and conquer kind of thing? What do you mean? In other words, that they split. No, this is what people themselves called themselves. Called themselves. Yeah. And did they consider themselves a nation? Yes, they, they considered. They you will see religiously they considered themselves part of the Judeans, but yeah. ethnically they were Galileans. Yeah. This is, yeah. This is so much like a Texan. Yeah, Texan I was, yeah. from the Republic of Texas, right. the state of Texas. He's a Texan. He's a Baptist. What are you going to do? <laughs> no, but I was just going to say that. Yeah. yeah. And it's like states' rights here. I mean, I, I, I've lived here for a long time, but I still consider myself um, a Bostonian. I mean, I, you know, yeah. American Jewish. You, know, you, you, hear, me. you hear me. You hear me. You hear it, okay. Yeah, no. Uh, um, uh, 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 Here's my accent. Well, not like what's-her-name in our class. Uh, in, in, <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, uh, yes. Yes. Sheila. Sheila, yes, yes. yes. Okay, so um, take a look at Book 6 of the Wars, uh, Chapter 2, on page 881, um, line 148, um, which is um, in paragraphs, the end of paragraph 6. All right? Uh, uh, bo uh, book 2. Six, chapter. chapter two, line 148, which is in the end of paragraph six. And it's on page 881 in our, uh, in most of your edition. Suzanne, do you want to read that? Wherein? Wherein those that signalized themselves on the Roman side were a great many, but on the Jewish side and of those that were with Simon, Judas the son of Myrto, and Simon the son of Josias, <coughs> Of the Idumeans, James and Simon, the latter of whom was the son of Cathlas, and James was the son of Sosus, 
Of those that were with John, Griftheus and Alexis, and of the zealots, Simon, the son of Jairus. Notice of the Idumeans. Mm -hmm. And the Jewish side, meaning the Judean side, included the Idumeans. Mm -hmm. So you see here the general designation of Judean and the particular designation of the Idumeans. Okay? I mean, I, we don't have to go through all of these, but you get the point. <coughs> so let's now look at um, the religious perspective on this. And for this, we're going to go back to the Antiquities, book 20, which is the last book of the Antiquities. Book 20, chapter 2. to page 633, uh, and we're looking at line 38, which is paragraph 4. So it's Antiquities, book 20, chapter 2, uh, paragraph 4, line 38. Page six. 633. So, Suzanne, you want to start reading it? And this takes place, this is about... Um, uh, Helena, the queen of Adia Bene. Now, I'll tell you in a minute where that is. <coughs> Go ahead. And when he perceived... when he perceived that his mother was highly pleased with the Jewish customs, he made haste to change and to embrace them entirely. And as he supposed that he could not be thoroughly a Jew unless he were circumcised, he was ready to have it done. But when his mother understood what he was about, she endeavored to hinder him from doing it, and said to him that this thing would bring him into danger, and that as he were a king, he would thereby bring himself into great odium among his subjects, when they would understand that he was so fond of rights that were to them strange and foreign, and that they would never bear to be ruled over by a Jew. Okay, so this whole chapter, which is quite fascinating, is about the conversion of Queen Helena and her son, Izates, of Adia Bene, to become a Judean. Now, this is completely religious, right? In this case, the translation of ruled over by a Jew, in our sense, is quite appropriate. Now, where was Adia Bene? Um, the capital of Adia Bene is a city you may have heard of because of recent events. It's the city of Erbil. Anybody know what Ur what Urbiel is today? Israel. I saw went and got the, uh, those people who in between the Christians. And uh, no, uh, Urbiel is the capital of Kurdistan. The independent, the semi-independent section of Iraq um, that is Kurdish ruled. The capital is Urbiel. And Erbil is one of the oldest inhabited, constantly inhabited cities in the world. There, they, there is a, a large um, citadel <coughs> that they have found in habitation going back to 3000 BCE. And um, it's been constantly rebuilt. It was considered uh, one of these citadels because it, uh, that was virtually, you know, impossible to conquer. But of course it has been conquered. And... Adia Bene was part of a larger um, Armenian empire. In other words, there was, for a period of a couple of hundred years, in the area that we call northern Iraq, parts of Syria and Turkey, up to what we now call Armenia, there was an Armenian empire. And Adia Bene was one of these was was one phase in this. Now, Adia Bene was a, um, an ally state with the Roman Empire, it was independent of the Romans, but under their protection, and it was one of the buffer states between the Eastern Empire and the Parthians, the ones, the, the dynasty of the Persians that were ruling to the east. You see, what happened was is that after Alexander conquered the Persian Empire, all of the Persian Empire, which includes all of what we call today Iran, Afghanistan, and even parts of Pakistan, came under um, the, uh, the, the general of, um, of Alexander called Seleucus, 
So the Seleucus Empire, which was the largest uh, in geography, where we got our Anti Anti Antiochus, Antiochus IV, included everything that had been the heartland of the, of the, of the Archimedid uh, Persian Empire, of which Antiochus was one of the rulers. When that empire um, um, falls apart, what happens is, is that the native-born Persians eventually um, revolt against the um, Greek rule, and a new dynasty comes in that we call the Parthians, and they take back a lot of what is was the eastern part um, of Afghanistan and, and part again the little bit of what we call Pakistan and um, Iran and even down into parts of Mesopotamia. Um, and what happens is, is for hundreds of years, the Parthians become the only major enemy of, that the that could threaten the Roman Empire, and they're fighting back and forth. And Adia Bene, in the time that it existed, was one of the buffer states. Um, eventually, they the that their empire was like basically, you know, torn between the Romans and the uh, and the and the Persians, the Parthians, and Erbil, <laughs> and all of the Mesopot Mesopotamia came under the Parthians. Um, it was um, Trajan briefly conquered Mesopotamia, but could not hold it. Um, and um, that's what happened. The Parthians were eventually replaced by a second, another dynasty who continued this fight with the Romans. So there was this kind of existential fight going on between the Persians, um, called the, you know the Parthian dynasty, and the Romans, and then the Sassanids, and lasted all the way up to the conquest of Islam. But so Adi Abeni at this point is an independent ally of the Roman Empire. The capital is Erbil. Um, it's an Armenian, in a sort of broader sense than we understand it now, empire. Um, and, and Queen Helena, sh the story is quite fascinating. If you read start the beginning of chapter um, uh, two, she, it says that she, um, uh, you know, uh, she is the widow of the previous king. Uh, she uh, takes over when he dies. She has this son who's going to become king, and she converts to Judaism. And then her son does as well, or wants to as well. So this is very obviously the religious designation of what it means to be a Judean. It, you can't get any more clear cut than that. Now the Romans, somebody had to support Josephus while he was doing what was right. Yeah, he was under he was living in Rome under the patronage of the Flavians. Yes. And they, and they basically hired him to to write this. No, no, he wrote it himself. I mean, he he wrote he wrote the war. Um, That's lecture one. That was Leia. If you listen to lecture one, you'll find it out. He, he, he wrote, I mean, partly the, the war is a little more polemic um, than uh, the antiquities, but that's what he did. He sat in Rome. He was under the patronage of uh, the Flavians. He was good friends of Titus and um, uh, King Herod Agrippa II, who was living there too. And he also had another guy who was his, uh, a patron, and he, that's what he did. That's what he did. Okay. Um, let's take a look at one more on the religion part, and this is Book 14. Yeah, the Antiquities, Book 14, Chapter 10. Um, line 215, which is... Um, Verse 8. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's on page 455. Um, it's line 215, which is in paragraph um, uh, 8, and it's um, uh, down towards the bottom of the page. Now, what he is, what's, what he's doing here is he is quoting a document from um, uh, by, I think he's from Julius Caesar. Yes. Uh, yeah. Caius. Caius Caesar. Yeah. Okay. So he's quoting a document um, to um, uh, to the Jews of Delos. Delos is an island in the Aegean, and there's a very old Jewish community there. One of the uh, was there. One of the oldest, uh, the ruins of one of the oldest synagogues. When you land there, they tell you to watch out for snakes. Uh, well, that I don't know. I've never <laughs> been there. <laughs> but the point is that 
they have found a synagogue on Delos that predates the destruction of the Second Temple, which those, they're very rare to find a synagogue from before 70. Um, they found some uh, evidence of that. Um, so, um, uh, Suzanne, why don't you pick it up? 215. Yeah. For even Caius Caesar, our imperator and council, in that degree wherein he forbade the Bacchanal rioters to meet in the city, did yet permit these Jews, and these only, both to bring in their contributions and to make their common suppers. Accordingly, when I forbid other Bacchanal rioters, I permit these Jews to gather themselves together according to the customs and laws of their forefathers and to persist there. Okay, stop there. Um, cross out Bacchanalian rioters and just put in the word association. This is one of the great mistranslations. Association? Yeah, association. Um, the word in Greek can mean an association, but it can also mean a group of people who are going off to a Bacchanalian. Okay? <laughs> Uh, it, it, this is like a complete mistranslation because the context doesn't, doesn't in any way suggest Bacchanalian rioters. Okay. Be quite a contrast. Yes, it is. So, I mean, you know, I, I, when I looked at this, it was like, what? Um, it didn't make sense. And when I looked it up, you know, the Greek itself, it, it just means association. So, um, what it's talking about is the officially recognized local. Jewish association, or we might even say the community, what about the federation. <laughs> he doesn't use the word synagogue, okay? It's not synagogue. Um, they, had a, they had a synagogue. They didn't call it a synagogue. They called it a prayer house, a prosuche. But what you're talking about is the legally recognized, what is called in other places, a polytuma, um, a recognized association of the Jews of Delos. And here, it's all about making sure that they're allowed to practice their, what we would call their religion, without any interference. That's what it's talking about here. In other words, um, you know, you can't, um, you, you can, these Jews can gather together to perform their ancient traditions. And so it's obvious it's talking about religious affiliation. It's not talking about ethnic or geographic. It's, it's a religious designation in this particular case. When you say association, you mean a gathering? No, I mean an official group, a recognized group. Okay? The Elks. The <laughs> no, it's, it's, like, it's like having a local Jewish federation that the local government well, in this case, the Roman government recognizes as a legitimate association. And, and it seems like they were having a problem, okay, that maybe the local authorities were trying to stop them from associating together or weren't recognizing them. And uh, Julius Caesar um, was um, very good at... Um, establishing the legal principle in the Roman territories, which then became followed by his successors, that the Jews had a legal standing as a legitimate religious group in the empire to practice without interference their traditions. Now, this was a very important thing because there were times when other religious groups were not recognized and in fact were suppressed, like at some point the Christians. Later on, um, certain um, Eastern, um, they were considered cults. You know what I'm saying? That um, it's, it wasn't a given thing. It, there wasn't what we would call freedom of worship. You had to get legal recognition by the authorities to do what you were doing if you were not an, a long-standing group. And the Jews from the time of Julius Caesar, and this is even after the wars, by the way, with the, except for the time of Hadrian, um, the Jews were not um, banned. persecuted, banned from practicing their traditions. Why, why let the Jews be the Jews? but not the Christians be the Christians. Well, because the Christians were new. I mean, for one thing, long-standing is important, and they were accused of all kinds of 
heinous things. Constantine didn't have his vision yet. No, that was hundreds yeah. of years later. I mean, part of, part of it is the, the, they were afraid that people, if too many people uh, became Christians, they wouldn't serve in the army. What's interesting is the Jews got an, ex, an exemption from serving in the army by Caesar because that might violate the Sabbath or the laws of Kashrut. But there were Jews who did serve in the Roman army, as you know, by the way. Okay, yes. Why is it, in my mind, all I think of when I think of the Roman Empire is them actually suppressing Judaism. Is this kind of just a total misunderstanding? No, you have to understand the wars against the Romans between the Jews and the Romans were the exception. They were the exception. I mean, you think about it, the, uh, Pompey conquers the East in 63 BCE, uh, until the time of uh, Constantine, um, you're talking close to 500 years. Over those 500 years, you've only got three period, short periods of time when the Jews revolted against the Romans. And secondly, and that was mostly in Judea. Um, and when there were problems, it was usually with the local population in Alexandria, for example. Uh, and even though Hadrian, after the Bar Kokhba revolt, did persecute the Jewish religion. I think it was only in Judea. So the point is that over the long stretch of Roman history, uh, the, the Jews actually were left alone most of the time, it, especially if they didn't revolt. They were only, there was only a problem when they revolted against the government, but that was true of anybody. Right. But, but all that, that when the Romans came in and they put their gods in the temple, which of course... They didn't actually ever do that. Um, um, Caligula tried. And um, th in other words, there, there were incidents, mm -hmm. but they almost all took place in Judea. Mm -hmm. Jews living in the rest of the empire were left alone. Even in Rome itself, there was a Jewish community. Mm. <coughs> and there were Romans who were practicing Jewish practices and converting to Judaism, and they were left alone. Yeah. By the way, the Christians were not really persecuted in Rome until about the year 200. No, there was an earlier, during the time there of Nero, some, during some, Nero, and Domitian, and during the time of Domitian, which is, uh, which is around uh, 90, 100. But, but it, wasn't, it wasn't major? No, it wasn't major. There was later that, you're right, you're right. Okay, so let's look at the last category, which is the notion of the citizenship or ally of the Judean state. Again, this is a lot rare. And here we're going to go to book 13 of the Antiquities, uh, chapter 9, line uh, 257, which is on page 423. Uh, it's in the, e the end of the paragraph. Uh, it's, it's line 257, which is the... the um, the end of uh, paragraph 1, which is right at the beginning of chapter 9. So it's book 13, um, chapter 9, uh, paragraph 1, starting at line 257, where it says Hyrcanus. Um, Phyllis, do you want to pick it up from there? Hyrcanus took also Dora and Marissa, <clears throat> cities of Idumea, and subdued all the Idumeans and permitted them to stay in that country. If they would circumcise their Gentiles and make use of the laws of the Jews, and they were so desirous of living in the country of their forefathers that they submitted to the use of circumcision and the rest of the Jewish ways of living, at which time, therefore, this befell them that they were hereafter no other than Jews. But Hyrcanus. Uh, okay, stop there. Okay, this is John Hyrcanus, who is the son of the uh, Maccabean ruler Simon. Okay, so this is taking place in the uh, 140s BCE. And he's talking about how John Hyrcanus um, conquered the Idumeans. Now, the Idumeans lived in uh, the territory of what we call a south of Hebron, which had been a part of ancient Judea in the first temple period. But what had happened was, is when, excuse me, uh, during the Babylonian exile and afterwards, the Idumeans, who are the Edomites, by the way, who lived um, in to the east, began moving into that area. 
So they were occupying what had been ancient Judea, but now was called Idumea. So Hyrcanus goes and conquers the Idumeans, and basically he gives them um, a choice. If they want to stay, they have to circumcise themselves and become a Judean. Now, the question here is, is this a religious conversion or is it citizenship? You are allowed to be part of my empire, says John Hyrcanus, and become a Judean, but the citizenship test is to be circumcised. This is, this is kind of on the edge there. Um, it could be, very likely, that what he is doing is granting them Judean citizenship. And what happens is, though, that the Idumeans, I mean, a bunch of them, by the way, did leave. They moved uh, west to the coast. Some of them ended up in Egypt. Um, but the Idumeans eventually become what we would call religiously Jews. They, take a, they, they play a large part in the war, by the way. Um, uh, a contingent of them comes to Jerusalem to help fight the Romans. But the point is that um, this might not be, I mean, this is usually um, given as an example of the only instance in Jewish history where a Jewish ruler did forced conversions. It may mean that, but it may, uh, it may also just mean uh, citizenship. Okay, but it yeah. Also says, and the rest of the Jewish ways of living. Yes. Oh, Don't forget, um, uh, Josephus is writing this 250 years later. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. okay, so. All right. and, and, he, and he knows the Idumeans are now part of the Jewish religion. But what, so what Hyrcanus may have done, because by the way, this is our only, this is the only place where this shows up. I got news for you. We don't have any other documents as far as I know about this, what may have happened originally, I mean, Josephus may be looking back and thinking that it's a religious conversion. From his perspective, it looks like a religious conversion. But in fact, what may have happened is it may have been a citizenship thing. That's all I'm saying. Yes, Why don't you Robert? call your students to find out whether they think it's religious or <laughs> Because I tell you, I vote for religious. Yeah, it sure uh, sounds uh, it. I, All I'm telling you is it's ambiguous. Uh, we don't know. Uh, you're, you're this is around 140 right. BCE, okay? If you look at the comment... The, the don't. These are really old and... Oh, it's they're it. not worth it. These are not, you know. Okay. By the way, I just learned from my son-in-law that there is a massive scholarly project to put out a scholarly edition, new edition of Ju Josephus, uh, you know, making sure they got the right manuscripts for the Greek, translating it. Apparently, it's a pretty academic translation, which means it's a little stilted sometimes, and comp full textual notes. Ooh. Apparently, it's it's this massive multi-volume thing, um, which would not be, you know, only available really to scholars. Um, I said, are they going to put it online? He's not sure. He showed me he had some of it on PDF. It's incredible, but it's not a kind, you, know, you wouldn't be able to get it in one volume. It's going to be old shelf, uh, and they're in the middle of it. And, uh, and um, it would be nice if in the future they either put it online um, or they uh, create a, you know, smaller version for general readers, but... Um, it, uh, he showed me some pages of it. It's incredible. I mean, it's like a little paragraph. It's like a Talmud, a little paragraph and a whole bunch of wow. comments, you know. Uh, anyway, um, so, yes, Robert. Are they going to continue to unjustifiably pillory Josephus? Uh, no, the, the academics try and keep, that, keep a distance in that, by the way. Okay, so um, I, I think we're finished with this. Now, um, what I want to move on to is um, a little bit about what did the Jewish religion look like at that time? Again, this is all according to Josephus. I'm not, we're not looking at any other sources, which there are obviously many. Um, and we're not going to, you know, you, you've got a whole bunch of references here, one to practice and one to believe. And, and we'll look at a couple of them um, before moving on to the next topic, which I think will take up a, a fair bit of time. So if you want to go, first of all, to the Jewish Wars, Book 7, uh, which is the last book of the wars. Um, 
and takes place after the destruction of the temple. This is where the, um, the it's in book 7 that the Masada story is found. But anyway, if you look at book 7, chapter 3, uh, line 50, which is on page 903, um, and it's, parag it's, um, uh, it's paragraph 3, it's in the, um, so it's in the middle of the left-hand column. Which chapter did we say? Uh, chapter, uh, book seven, chapter four of the, uh, chapter three, sorry, chapter three of the wars, line 50. Phyllis, you got that? It says, yeah, as for Antiochus. As for Antiochus, he aggravated the rage they were in and thought to give them a demonstration of his own conversion and of his hatred of the Jewish customs by sacrificing after the manner of the Greeks. He persuaded the rest also to compel them to do the same, because they would by that means discover who they were that had plotted against them, since they would not do so. And when the people of Antioch tried the experiment, some few complied, but those that would not do so were slain. All right, we, all right, let's stop there. Um, what you have here is a, an account that took place after the destruction of Jerusalem in the city of Antioch. And apparently there, there was a guy named Antiochus, who, um, and, Anti and, and Antioch was in the province of Syria. Um, he... Um, uh, uh, he wanted to stir up the uh, local population against the Jews and notice his hatred of the Jewish custom by sacrificing after manner of the Greeks. In other words, the Jewish tradition, what, the Jews were primarily identified by their practices more than anything else. Um with one theological exception. And, and what, how were the Jews most often recognized? Well, they circumcised their sons. They didn't eat pork. They didn't eat pig. They didn't work on the seventh day. And they only believed in one God and refused to sacrifice to any other God. Those were the things that Gentiles noticed the most. And what you'll notice, those are the things which separated themselves from the rest, uh, the, the non-Jews. So th th that's a really important thing to know, that this is how the Jews were known, and it was by their practices um, and what they refused to do like everybody else that set them apart. And, and by the time of Josephus, Circumcision had become rare amongst non-Jewish groups. In other words, you know, back in the time of ancient Israel, there were a number of different groups that... Circumcision was not an unusual custom, but under the influence of the Greeks, it had become inc much rarer in anybody but the Jews. And Greek sacrifice. Well, you know, sacrifice, he meant sacrificing to the gods. Okay? All right. Um, since we're in the Jewish wars, let's look at book six, uh, chapter nine, which is uh, uh, line 420, which is found on 898, and that's paragraph three. So we're looking at uh, book six, Chapter 9, line 420, which is paragraph 3, found on page 898. Robert, you want to pick it up? It says, now there... What? Now the number. It's nice that they give you a little summary before... Each, yeah, each yeah, exactly. It's the second last chapter of book 6. Yeah, 898. Was that in Josephus himself? Sorry, did he give those summaries? I have no idea. No, he did not. It's a translation. Okay. Now the number of those that were carried captive. Now, now the numbers of those that were carried captive during this whole war was collected to be 97,000. 
as was the number of those who perished during the whole siege, 1,100,000. So it's, these are the numbers he claims were carried off into slavery and those that were killed, okay? So 1,100,000 000 is a million one hundred thousand people. Now, statistics like this are completely, you know, unreliable. We have no idea how close they are to the truth, but it's obviously a huge number. Go on. The greater, the greater part. part of whom were indeed of the same nation with the citizens of Jerusalem, but not belonging to the city itself. For they were come up from all the country to the feast of unleavened bread, and were on a sudden shut up by an army which at the very first, occasion so great as straightness amongst them that they ca that there came a pestle, a pestilent pestilential destruction upon them, and soon there soon afterwards such a famine as destroyed them more suddenly. So his claim was is that at the time of the siege, a lot of the people in Jerusalem were from the country who had gone there for Passover, the unleavened bread, and they got stuck there. And a lot of them died of disease. This, this is quite, I'm sure he was absolutely right in this. Because the Romans, part of their siege strategy was they built a wall of wood all around the city to prevent anybody from getting out because they used up their food and they wanted to starve them out if possible. Read on. And, and that, that this city could contain so many people in it, manifest by the number of them that was taken under Cestius, who being desirous of informing Nero of the power of the city, who otherwise was disposed to, con to contemn, yeah. that, or condemn that nation, entreated the high priests, if the thing were possible, to take the number of their whole multitude. So earlier on, the procreator Cestius, during the time of Nero, um, uh, he wanted to count the people in Jerusalem to, you know, is to show how big, uh, you know, uh, group he was ruling under. So these high priests. So these high priests, upon the coming of their feast, which is called Passover, mm -hmm. when they slay their sacrifices from the ninth hour until the eleventh, but so that a company not less than ten, no. not less than ten, belonging to every sacrifice, for it is not lawful for them to feast singly by themselves, and many of us are twenty in a company. Found the number of sacrifices was two hundred and fifty six thousand five hundred, which Upon the allowance of no more than ten that feasted together, it amounts to two million seven hundred who were pure and holy. For as for as to those who have the leprosy, or the gonorrhea, or women who have their monthly courses, or such as otherwise polluted, it is not lawful for them to be partakers of this sacrifice, nor indeed for any foreigners either. Who come hither to worship. Now, he's talking here about the law in the Torah that you're supposed to go to Jerusalem and ha sacrifice a goat or a lamb, um, but you eat it together, what we call the Seder today, and that it's not done as a group, but uh, as a single person, but as, in a family or a group. And he's saying it could be anywhere from 10 to 20 people, and the only people who could be excluded from this were people who were impure by the laws of Leviticus and therefore were not permitted to do it, which is why we have the uh, uh, Pesach Sheni, the second Passover, a month later in the Jewish calendar for those who were um, either for some reason they were away and couldn't get back or they were, they were in a polluted state. Because remember, the purity laws were um, strictly observed um, on these occasions in Jerusalem in this period of time. Most of these laws don't, well, they, none of them apply anymore to the Seder. And notice, so he says anybody who is excluded, so here's this huge number of people who were participating that year in the Pesach sacrifice, and that did not count the people who were in a state of impurity and the foreigners who weren't allowed to be there either. Well, we're talking right around um, uh, the time of the beginning of the war, around 66. Okay, right okay, so that's why they all got stuck there. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right. Um, uh, re, uh, we, yeah, that will stop there. So that, that, that gives you um, an idea of, um, of some of the things that um, is going on. And if you go down to this list, I, you know, I've given you passages which mention various Jewish practices of the kind I was telling you, all right? Now, 
in the second one, <coughs> we've, we, we're talking about issues of belief. And this is a little stickier because um, Josephus never kind of lays it out anywhere exactly what the Jewish belief system is. So you got to kind of find a few things here and there. Um, and um, so if you go to the beginning of the Antiquities, book one, uh, chapter seven, we'll see a couple of examples of, uh, of sort of, you know, places where he mentions Jewish belief. And in the early part of the Antiquities, you know, he's, he's retelling all the stories of the Bible from the creation to um, uh, down to his own day. So we're on page 43. And it's um, book one, chapter seven, line 155. And it's, uh, so it's, he's talking about Abraham uh, leaving Haran. And um, this is on page 43, line 155. Do you have that, Robert? Oh, I, I have the book back. Okay, we'll let you do this one more and then we'll give you a break. For which reason? No, no. It's then it's skipped down to the next number. Uh, it's talking about Abraham. For which reason he began? For which reason he began to have higher notions of virtue than others had, and he determined to renew and to change the opinion of all men happening then to have concerning God. For he was the first adventure to publish this notion that there was but one God, the Creator of the universe, and that as to the other gods, if they contributed anything to the happiness of men that each of them afforded it only according to his appointment and not by their own power. So, he is attributing as typical for the Jews at that time the beginning of monotheism to uh, Abraham. And this being, yes. Abraham being the, you don't have to read any more, you know, Abraham being the father of the Jewish people, um, this is sort of an essential element of Jewish belief that there's only one God. And if there are other gods, they're like demigods. They're not the supreme God. All right. Um, let's now go back to, to chapter three of the first book of antiquities. Um, this is in the Noah story, page 37, um, line 72, which is the first paragraph. It's the very first paragraph of chapter three on page 37. Cal, why don't you pick it up there? It's talking about um, Seth, the um, the son of, um, oh, actually, it, it's a, yeah, go on. It, it's about one of the sons of Noah. Now this posterity of Seth continued to esteem God as the Lord of the universe and to have an entire regard to virtue for seven generations. No, it's, Seth is the, the son of Adam. Sorry, go ahead. But in process of time, they were perverted and forsook the practices of their forefathers and did neither pay those honors to God which were appointed them nor had they any concern to do justice toward men. But for what degree of zeal they have formerly shown for virtue, they now showed by their actions a double degree of wickedness, whereby they made God to be their enemy. For many angels of God kept company with women, and begat sons that proved unjust, and despisers of all that was good, on account of the confidence they had in their own strength. For the tradition is, that these men did what resembled the acts of those whom the Grecians called giants. Stop there. Um, he's telling the story that's found in the uh, in Genesis of how the sons of God, the B'nai Elohim, come down and mate with the daughters of men and produce the Nephilim. And he is, you know, just, he says they're like the Greeks um, thing of the giants. What's fascinating is, is that when you look through Josephus, he doesn't like talking about angels. This is one of the rare circumstances where he can't avoid it. But when he retells a number of the biblical stories where an angel appears, he eliminates the angel. He either has God talking directly or some other thing. He's not, he, he, again, he's writing this for a non-Jewish audience, and he is trying to present something that's more strictly monotheistic. He downplays um, miracles, by the way, um, and, and, and especially weir really weird ones like um, the donkey and Balaam. And, and so he's, he's trying to project a purer form of monotheism 
to the non-Jewish uh, world. But in, are we talking about specifically the Torah or the entire Tanakh? Uh, the angels it, are really hardly mentioned as angels. Yeah, no, but they're mentioned as a. They're mentioned. They're obviously angels, even if they're called men. Yeah. Um, so he tries to. I mean, for example, you know, he he eliminates, for example, in the story of. Um, of Jacob, um, uh, he, elim he, he eliminates the, uh, no, he eliminates the angels going up and down the ladder. Um, like if you look on page 50, um, well, I think I gave it to you, I think it's it's chapter 19. Um, yeah, if you look at chapter, let's, we'll skip to that, go to chapter 19 on page 55. Yeah, this is where it's very interesting. Uh, it's chapter 19 on page 55 of book one. It's paragraph one, and this is the story of the uh, the dream of Jacob. Sorry, what, what is that again? Chap book, uh, one. book one, chapter 19, paragraph one, um, line 279. He uh, it's 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 where Jacob uh, has his dream of the angels going up and down the ladder. But look what it says. Cal, do you want to pick it up? But took up his lodging but took up his lodging in the open air and laid his head on a heap of stones that he had gathered together, at which time he saw in his sleep such a vision standing by him. He seemed to see a ladder that reached from earth to heaven and persons descending upon the ladder that seemed more excellent than human. And at last God himself stood above it and was plainly visible to him, who, calling him by his name, now, the word there in Greek is, in fact, um, opses, op, opses, which, in fact, means phantom vis phantoms or visions. So, he's not using the word angelos, meaning angels. Mm -hmm. He's making it sound like it's not, it's not angels, that it's a, it's a vision, it's a dream. It has nothing to do with anything real. All right? So he, he, he does this on numerous occasions. So Josephus is, is trying to sort of project a stronger, stricter monotheism to the non-Jewish world by downplaying angels and miracles. Is this your interpretation or is this the generally accepted interpretation? You can read it there. I mean, you can, if you go through it, if you go through all the biblical stories where an angel shows up, you'll see in some cases he's completely eliminated them. No, no, the, the, the follow-on from that being he wanted to present... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's accepted. It, in other words, it's pretty obvious that's what he's doing. In other words, you have to understand, when he's retelling the biblical stories, he, in some cases, is not just telling us what's in the Bible, he's doing what we would call interpretation, midrash, you know. I mean... That, that's what you see, okay? He's not just copying the story from the, from the Tanakh. He's retelling it. The non-Jews wouldn't have read the Greek version of the, of the Tanakh, would they? Doesn't matter. I mean, when you get to Moses, for example, he's got all these legends that have been around for hundreds of years about what Moses was doing when he was a prince of Egypt, which was like he goes and he, he becomes a general of the Egyptian army. I mean, there's all these stories of... Uh, these midrashim about the earlier career of Moses before he became the savior of the slaves that had been around, as I said, for by his time, for several hundred years. And he writes them down. We have other earlier sources that mention this. Yeah. What would have been his agenda in wanting to be First of all, he was telling them the way he understood them. In other words, um, uh, and... and he was doing what was already had been done in the Jewish community for hundreds of years, which are what we call biblical paraphrases. Not just, it's not a translation, remember. He's not translating the Bible. He's telling the stories of them. And in doing so, he's making interpretations. And he's also quoting all these other sources that had been around for hundreds of years that were doing, telling doing what we would call midrash, like the rabbis did, right? Mm -hmm. But that was later. Did he feel... Midrash goes back to the Bible itself. It does. Oh, yeah. Oh, did yeah. he feel the need to justify... Were, were there attacks? Did he feel the need to, to justify the Jews or... Um, how say, apologize? Yes. For the Jews yes, there were... 
you have to understand, there were attacks on the Jewish religion. I mean, when you read his work against Apian, he is directly confronting scurrilous attacks on Judaism. But also, like any Jew, like Philo did, and like later on, Maimonides and other Jewish thinkers, he is trying to put the best foot forward in describing the history of the Jewish people to a world that might be hostile, especially even though it may be 20 years after the war. You know? And yet, and but they yet. were not monotheistic, the rest of the world. Well, you know, there were, amongst the intelligentsia in Rome, they were, you might say, philosophically monotheistic. And they attacked anything that sounded um, ridiculous and contrary to natural law. So a story like the talking ass in the Billum story to them right. would be absurd. So they would, there were Greeks who went to the Tanakh and pointed out what they considered to be absurd stories that were contrary to natural law. And in, in, in addition to which, they didn't like the idea that Jewish practices separated them from other people. And, and they would attack them. Mm -hmm. So he, and by retelling these things um, in this particular way, again, he's doing something that had been done in the Greek-speaking Jewish community for hundreds of years. Um, they, he was trying to present the best possible picture. And so, yeah, there is an apologetic element here. Yeah. And yet the previous line, line one, at number 278, yeah. he refers to uh, Isaac as being obsequious. He says... Yes. In order to marry Laban, her brother's daughter, which marriage was permitted by Isaac on account of his obsequiousness to the desires of his wife. That's a midrash. He's interpreting Isaac as being, you know, he's reading the character of Rebecca actually quite accurately that she was the dominant partner in the marriage. Well, she was, but he wasn't being obsequious. Wasn't he so much fading mentally? Uh, you could interpret it either way. That's what the book says. That's yeah, I know. What I'm saying is so this why is why would you say this? Because this negative. is his midrash. This is very negative. If he's trying to present a positive uh, aspect uh, of things, he's 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 trying to interpret the story. He's not going to be. Um, he, he's he's not going to always smooth. I mean, it, I, I think that's a fascinating midrash. He's not always going to make everything beautiful. Yeah, exactly. But he's going to. Again, you're talking here about Midrash, and I'm using a rabbinic term, but the concept of Midrash itself goes back to the Tanakh itself. The retelling or interpretation of earlier text. Could have said deference, you know. I don't know what the Greek is, so it could... It, the, the, the Greek, The Greek could not be as bad as the English. I, I didn't check it. I could do that, but that that's the point. Okay. Um, all right, so... You know, I, I wanted to give you a little example of that. If you want to read some of the others, you can see it. Uh, the point is, he in retelling the biblical stories, you get a sense of what he was about in terms of his Jewish. His Judaism is one where he uh, follows the, he, he, the traditional beliefs but he and the traditional practices. He understands them to be central. After all, he is a Kohen. He is a priest. Um, and um, I didn't, the parts, we, one of the parts we didn't read is um, in the practices, he doesn't have a very high opinion of women, by the way. Um, uh, and uh, we saw that a little bit from his life, you know, about his marriages, whatever. But he, he does have a couple of passages where he kind of doesn't, uh, you know, it's not very nice about it. But the point is, um, uh, he is retelling uh, this, the story, the classic stories of Judaism and trying to put them in the best possible light by taking out things that would qualify monotheism, which sophisticated Greeks and Romans would look at and say, look at the absurdity of this faith. Okay? All right. So, let's move on to our next topic, which is a continuation of the Jewish life, uh, the Jewish world. But now we're going to look at something which is, in many ways, the most important um, element of this, which are the various groups that Josephus describes throughout his work. Um, most importantly, what he calls the three philosophies or philosophical schools of the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the Essenes. Um, we'll start with them. 
and we won't get, we won't finish it today. Um, and then we go to what he calls the fourth philosophy, in which he refers to a whole group under various terms, the brigands, tyrants, Sicarii, and the zealots. And there's some interesting problems with those terms. And um, he, we will also look at, um, very briefly, the Samaritans, and of course, what text we have about the Christian world, the early, the beginnings of Christianity, which aren't very much, and subject to a lot of, um, by the way, Suzanne, I read that article. Did you? Yes, uh, very helpful. Okay, so we're going to begin with um, the a description of the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the Essenes, and he does this in four different places in the wars, the antiquities, and the life. He describes, he has a general description of these three groups. The, we're not going to do the life because we already looked at it, where he talked about, you know, there are three groups and, you know, I'm, I tried them all out. But we're going to look at the first one, which is the, not the oldest, but the shortest, which is the Antiquities, Book 13. If you go to Book 13, Chapter 5, which is on page 415, uh, chap uh, Book 13, Chapter 5, Paragraph 9, which is at the bottom of the page, Line one, we'll start at 171 rather than, I wrote down 173, it should be. Now, he is describing the period of time during the high priest Jonathan, who is the older brother of Simon the Maccabee. Remember, we talked John Hyrcanus. John Hyrcanus' father was Simon. Simon's brother was Jonathan. And they were brothers to Judah, who got killed in the wars. So Jonathan became the high priest. And so we're talking the mid-140s BCE here. And this, chronologically, is the earliest description of the Sadducees, Pharisees, and Essenes. In other words, Josephus, in the previous, any of the previous histories mentioned, they don't appear. They don't appear in any of earlier sources, like the books of Maccabees. So our assumption is that Josephus, he's reporting something now that's almost 250 years before the time he's writing, but that he is ascribing the emergence of these three groups to the time of Jonathan, the high priest. If we were to look at outside sources, we would say that's probably correct and that it's very likely that the community of the Dead Sea Scrolls are precisely emerges at that same time. So this is the beginning of a particular kind of, sect, what I'm going to use the term very cautiously here, sectarianism that emerges within the Jewish community of Judea. This is in the, in the, uh Five books of Moses? No, no, no. This has nothing to do with that. Okay, so where is this? This is Jonathan, Jonathan is is in uh, is one of the is is one of the uh, uh, Maccabeans. So where was it? In Judea, and, and, the Maccabean revolt, the Hanukkah story. Oh, okay, so where is this written initially? Here. 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 Yeah, He's the only the place. place. <laughs> He's the only place. If you look at the actual okay. sources from that period. The first book of Maccabees, the second book of Maccabees, okay. they, um, first of all, they don't cover this period. Um, and the only other sources we have are uh, indirect sources, uh, but there's obvious references in the Dead Sea Scrolls to Jonathan, attacking him, by the way. Mm -hmm. So we are assuming that Josephus is correct, that th these three groups emerge in the 140s BCE. As a geographical group or as a religious group? Uh, well, we'll find out what they what he means. All right, I'm not going to. They're not geographical, but what they are will be very interesting. <laughs> 140 BCE. 140 BCE. So this is right after Judas was killed. Or? This is uh, you know a few yeah ten years or so yeah okay. All right, so um, everybody got the historical period because I I, I yeah. want to uh, Sam you didn't seem to quite get it I want to make sure you get it. 
You, you got when this is happening? Yeah, you said 140 BCE. Yeah, BCE. Okay, and it's, 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 he, Josephus is not talking about something, it's something we only have here. Okay? I, I want everybody to be absolutely clear. I'm sorry for saying it, but I That's want to make right. sure absolutely is everybody clear that he's talking about something about 250 years before he lived. He's talking about three groups that he knows about. They existed during his lifetime. And he is trying to... And this is the first time they're mentioned in the antiquities. So he is... We are... Historians assume that he was accurate in describing... He doesn't talk about their origin, but this is the first time they're mentioned. So the assumption is this is when they emerged. Got it? Mm -hmm. All right, let's read it because this is the shortest of his descriptions of the groups. Okay, so Cal, you want to pick it up at this time? At this time, there were three sects among the Jews who had different opinions concerning human action. Now, the word sect is an improper translation. The, the Greek word is eiresis, where we get our word heresy from, but it doesn't mean that here. It means schools. Mm -hmm. Schools of thought. This is a way to describe it to his Greek and Roman readers that they will understand. He's talking about them, and this is part of the problem with Josephus' discussions of them. He's putting them in terms that his audience will understand, and that doesn't necessarily mean that's the way they understood themselves. So we have to be very careful of his language. He is describing them as philosophical schools. Now we know there were all kinds of philosophical schools in the ancient world, right? The Pythagoreans, the, those were the Platonists, the Aristotelians, the Epicureans, all kinds of Greek philosophical schools of thought. That's the way he's describing them. Go on. The one was called the school of the Pharisees, another the school of the Sadducees, and the other the school of the Essenes. Now, we're not sure of the origin of the names of these groups. We assume that Pharisee comes from the Hebrew word for to separate, prushim, because the Pharisees separated themselves from the rest of the community by their practices. What is, that, what is the shortage? Prushim. Pei, Reish, uh, uh, Pei, Reish, Shin. Parash. Okay? Um, the Sadducees probably come from Tzadok, who is the high priest in the time of King Solomon. The Essenes is the one we're really not sure of. We have no idea where it comes from. It might, and this is a big if, and a lot of people don't think so, be, come from Hasid, because there were a group of people in the Maccabean times called the Hasidim, but it's not likely that that's the case. We just don't know where the term Essene comes from, and if we assume the people at Qumran were the Essenes, they never call themselves that. They call themselves the Yahad, the community. So we have no idea what the word Essene really means. Children of life? It doesn't in Greek we have no it doesn't mean anything in Greek. In other words, we just don't know what it means. All right, read on. Now for the Pharisees. Now for the Pharisees, they say that some actions, but not all, are the work of faith. All right, the word there in Greek is emma ro enes, which e which can mean fate, but in the sense of um, predetermination. Your in other words. You, uh, predestination, your actions have been predetermined by God. Not fate the way the Greeks understood it as this, this thing that goes over the gods themselves that predetermines even the life of the gods. This is a Jewish thing. He's using a term the Greeks would understand, but he's not using it in the way that Greek concepts of fate are understood. It's, and in fact, it's not even the, the same, really. This, you know, it's predestination, the way we Jewishly understand it. Go on. And, and some of them, them yeah. Are in our own power, and that they are liable to fate, but are not caused by fate. This is interesting, that there is both free will and predestination, which we actually see in rabbinic sources, mm -hmm. in Perkei Avot. Rabbi Akiva says, all is determined, yet free, yet free choice is given. 
So the so and since we assume the rabbis are the descendants of the Pharisees, um, this is a very good Pharisaical idea that there is predestination, but within the context of predestination, we still have some room for free will. All right, they accept what we would consider a contradiction, um, but they don't. They accept both sides of the equation. Read on. But the sect of the Essenes affirm that fate governs all things, and that nothing befalls men but what is according to its determination. The Essenes don't believe in free will at all, which is rare in the Jewish, uh, Jewish history, but not unheard of. They believe that God controls, and all of our actions are determined by God. Go on. As for the Sadducees... And as for the Sadducees, they take away fate and say there is no such thing and that the events of human affairs are not at its disposal. But they suppose that all our actions are in our own power, so that we are ourselves the cause of what is good and receive what is evil from our own folly. However, I have given a more exact account of these opinions in the second book of the Jewish War. And he's referring to his earlier work where we will see he gives a much larger account of these things, but we're starting with the, this because chronologically it's the oldest. It, it, not, not when he wrote it, but when he's attributing to it. Now notice, he doesn't tell about the practices of these groups. He doesn't tell us what they're doing. He sees them emerging as, and he describes them as philosophical schools, and the one area he chooses in this particular part of the antiquities, okay, which he will later on give another account in the antiquities, is the whole issue of a philosophical discussion of the notion of free will and predestination. That's all he says here. As we will see, though, um, and we're going to have to stop, um, what you will see is that it seems that when you're coming, when you talk about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he doesn't mention the Sadducees very much at all, when you actually look and we'll see the other references to the Sadducees, they seem to be their activities at the time, uh, a little later than this, under John Herkinus, Simon's son, is completely political. They seem to be a political group. The Sadducees and the Pharisees seem to be uh, originally a pol political groups within they may have their own religious ideas and philosophical ideas and even some practices, but their primary activity seems to be political. We're going to be dealing with that next week. Yeah, exactly. It's quite interesting um, because they get involved in political affairs and, you know, power plays and all kinds of things. But at the moment, if you're reading the Antiquities, this is the first time they show up. Okay. We're going to look at the one in the Jewish Wars next because that's one of the largest descriptions on this, especially the Essenes. He spends a lot of time talking about the Essenes and what they do because they're so different than everybody else. Okay? So, um, we'll stop there. Um, this is the last day of Hanukkah, so happy Hanukkah and um, happy new year. We'll see you in the new year. And I will try and get this recording out. No. No, you won't see us in the new year.